Now, let's go take a look at the text in um, Acts. Now, he quoted these passages. So let's take a look at them very quickly. Let's go to the book of Acts. And I need to pull this over some so I can see it. Acts chapter 24. All right. He cited this text. And again, he's citing these passages without paying attention to what they're actually teaching. So here's what Paul says. And by the way, uh, not only did he quote this one, but he quoted Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 as well. And he didn't cite the full context of that as well. In other words, he separated it from verse 1 as though verse 1 did not exist. But at any rate, let's take a look. In Acts 24 and verses 13 through 15, you have the Jews who were accusing Paul of teaching a doctrine that was contrary to the law and the prophets. And Paul said they couldn't prove the things of which they accused him. And so he says, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God which they themselves also accept. Oh, by the way, before I get too far from here, Michael Holloway likes to separate the law from the prophets. He, he likes to say that the law has already been fulfilled, okay? And that it was fulfilled on the cross when Jesus said, um, it is finished. But he says the prophets are still in force. As a matter of fact, if you go back and listen to his video, there was some guy, I don't know what his name was, it uh, could have been, uh, well, I'm not even going to try, but there was some guy who asked the question of him or made the statement that the law and the prophets continued, and he says, uh, or, or that the law and the prophets had to be fulfilled. He says, well, no, I don't believe that the prophets have been fulfilled. They're still being fulfilled, but the law has been fulfilled. So he separates that. But now watch what Paul says. Paul says, this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written where? In the law and in the prophets. So Michael Holloway's got a problem. See, he's trying to get rid of the law, and uh, he can't do it according to Scripture. Now, he can run to the church fathers all day long, but according to the Scriptures, he can't do it because the Scripture says Paul's gospel, his eschatology, was according to all things written in the law and in the prophets. So he should have just said in the prophets and not the law, according to the doctrine of Holloway. But there you go. And now watch verse 15. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. Now, the only place you find in the Old Testament scripture that mentions the resurrection of both the just and the unjust is in Daniel chapter 12. This is a quote from Daniel chapter 12. But now watch this in the same chapter. Now remember, we saw in 2 Timothy where he said there is about to be, the that, that the Lord was about to judge the living and the dead. Well, watch right here in Acts 24. Because see, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 is also a quote from Daniel 12 and verse 2. But so is Acts 24 and 14. Now, let's go back to the Greek and take a look. I'll just go ahead and do it with the King James Version so you can see both the English and the Greek. And uh, what verse, let's see, 24, 15. And here we are. There's the word shell again. There's your G3195. It's the word mellow. There is about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. See, futurists can't use these terms when they talk about what they're, uh, you know, about their futurism, because, you know, how are they going to say there's about to be? And, and, and he does it. He tries it. As a matter of fact, he will, it, he will acknowledge that these things were at hand. Let me give you another quote from Daniel chapter 12, since we're on Daniel chapter 12, uh, before I even go to Daniel chapter 12. Let's go to um, Romans 13, for example. Now, Kenneth Gentry tried this as well. He tried to argue for Acts 24, 15 uh, as a future judgment separate and apart from the use of the term at hand. But let's look at Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13, starting in verse 11, 
And let me get to something just clear because we don't need to see all of the um, all of the Greek there. Verse 11, again, another quote from Daniel 12. And do this knowing the time. Now, the word here, as well, I better do it just to make sure because, you know, I forget these things from time to time. So you do have to go back and look at them. Uh, let's see what we got. It's word time. All right, it is kairos. That is the exact word that's used in Daniel 12 and verse 1. It's used four times in the first verse of Daniel 4. All right? So, I mean, Daniel 12 and verse 1. Every time you see the word time in Daniel 12, 1, it is the word kairos, and it means the appointed time time. All right. So let's work with that a little bit. So he says, knowing the appointed time. Now watch this word that now, you know, it amazes me how many times people read over the word N-O-W in these eschatological passages and want to push them way out into our future. Paul said, knowing the appointed time that now it is, now watch this, the horror, the hour to awake out of sleep. Well, there's Daniel 12. Those who were sleeping in the dust of the earth. Now, he tried to argue for dust being uh, the literal dirt and um, that there were bodies in the literal dirt. We'll, we'll talk about that. I might forget it before I get done because, I mean, I got so much stuff I could say here. It's just, <laughs> it's just wild. But anyway... He says, it is the hour that now it is the hour to awake out of sleep. For now, that's the second time that word is used. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. You see, if you take what Paul said and you stay connected to the temple, you can see how these events were very near and very soon to occur. But let's go on. The night is far spent. And darkness is a euphemism for uh, for um, death. So to bring them out of darkness is to bring them out of the dust. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, has drawn near. You know what Michael Holloway will say about this? <laughs> He will say, well, yes, it was at hand then, but it's also at hand now. But he doesn't give you a scripture that says it's at hand now. We have one to say it was at hand then, just like we have the word now in the text. We have the word hour in the text. We have the word appointed time in the text. And so he says, let us, that's the first century. Now, if this at hand didn't apply until sometime today and beyond, then why the exhortation to them to cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light? Now, why are they putting on the armor of light? Because that's exactly what Daniel said. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. And he says, and many of those, or those who are wise, will turn many to righteousness and will shine in the brightness of the firmament. There's the light that he's talking about in the text. And that's precisely what he's saying here. Now, let's go with Michael's definition of at hand, his use of at hand, because he tries that on every single text. If you go back and look at our original debate, that's exactly what he was doing in that debate saying, well, yes, it's at hand. As a matter of fact, I have a quote from him in those correspondences that we were having when he says, oh, yes, it was at hand then. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find that. Um, he said, yes, it was at hand then, but it's also at hand now. Well, let's check that math for a second, and then I'll come back to some more of this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and the verses 6, Paul said, I am now, there's our word now, ready to be offered. And the time of my departure 
is at hand. So if at hand means at hand then and at hand now, then Paul died then and he's about to die now. That's the logic of the future is for you. But let's go back to the book of Acts. Because he quoted all these scriptures. Let's look at Acts 26, verses 6 through 8. All right, here we are. Why should it be, uh, let's see, Acts 26. Yeah, why should it be thought, no, I want to go back before that. Verse 6, I'm reading verse 8. All right. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Now watch this. Now I doubt if I'll get to it, but I'd love to get to it. And I, I just might. <laughs> since we're on. But he says, to this promise, our 12 tribes. Now you know what? Michael affirmed that the 12 tribes of Israel are still in existence today. This is after the temple has been destroyed. This is after all the genealogical tables have been destroyed. I guess he has a 12 tribe chart too, where he can point out all the tribes of Israel. Um, rather interesting, I say. <laughs> Earnestly serving God night and day. But see, that's a part of his doctrine that he doesn't really let on to. And, um, and that's because he's got this future of Israel doctrine in his paradigm that extends beyond 70 A.D., so he still has a future of Israel. I wonder if he thinks that the people over in Palestine uh, represent the um, Israel of the Bible. I don't know. He hasn't said that, but he got them somewhere. I don't know where they are. If they're not in the land, they're somewhere. Uh, apparently, he doesn't think they're in the land because it's still his future. All right, but anyway, he says, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. All right, now, let's look down in verses um, 17 and 18 in this very um, chapter. All right, he says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them, notice this, from darkness to light. See, that's resurrection terminology. And from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So when we're talking about resurrection, we're talking about delivering them from sin death. And I'll have more to say on that. Um, you know, don't know how long I'll go tonight since it's already late, but you know, I'll, I'll do some more reviews of this um, in the future. And let me say this, you know, Michael threw out a lot of passages and, um, you know, that's, that's what debaters do. They throw out a, a ton of texts and then they say, okay, answer all this stuff. Well, if you want to do a fairly decent job of responding, and I realize you have to respond on a time frame, but see, I'm not on any time frame here. Um, but just to throw out things and make assertions about them is no proof of anything. All right, so the next thing I'd like to do is go to First Peter chapter 4 uh, very quick. Well, even before then, let's go back to um, Acts 24 and watch. Because you have this term used again, Acts 24 and 24. It says, and after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, uh, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now remember what Paul said, all these were constitu constituent elements. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So watch the language here. Let's go back to the Greek, take a look. No, this is not the one. So I'm, uh, it's not found in this particular one, but it was the judgment to, uh, to come. And so this is still the same judgment that he talked about in the other text. Now, let me pull a scripture that he did 
uh, choose in this context. And um, that's Acts chapter 17. So let's take a look because it's resurrection and it is about the judgment. Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. All right. He says, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now command all, uh, commanded all men to everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day. All right. Um, he has appointed a day. So it's a set time in which he will. There's your word, Melo, once again. He is about to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men that he had raised him from the dead. Now, while we're on this text, Acts 17 and verse 31 is a parallel to Matthew 24, and the verse is uh, 15, four, 14. I'm getting some water. Okay, sorry about that. I'm thirsty. Now watch the uh, particular constituent elements of this text. All right, so he's appointed, well, first of all, in verse 30, it says, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Okay, what are they repenting through? They're repenting through the gospel. So that's the gospel being preached. They're not teaching a different gospel in Athens than what they taught throughout the rest of the world. They were told to go into all the world, all the inhabited earth, and preach the gospel to all the nations. And he says, and when this gospel has been published in all the world to all the nations, then the end will come. So here we are in Athens, where he says he's appointed a day uh, in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Well, if you're going to judge it in righteousness, you're judging it by the gospel. All right. The gospel is the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And therefore, he was about to judge the living and the dead. So you see this consistency in time all the way through. And therefore, if you're going to address the preterist view, time is a significant factor. The temple is a significant factor that has to be taken in consideration. If you're forming an argument or doctrine that is not considering these and doing it honestly and fairly, then, you know, you're just basically making noise because, you know, you're like a sounding brass and clanging cymbal. Um, in First Peter, since we're on this resurrection, chapter 4 and the verse is 5. Peter said, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And then he says, but the end of all things is at hand. So there it is again. Well, I guess that means it was at hand then. Well, now, wait a minute. If it was at hand then, does that mean it was supposed to occur soon or not? And if it's at hand today, does that mean it's supposed to occur soon or not? And so he tells them to be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, here's another text in verse 17, just pulling these out. For the time has come for judgment. All right, I want to look at that in the Greek real quick. I keep forgetting to um, highlight them. For the time has come uh, that judgment must begin. Uh, actually, if you look in um, a Greek text, I don't know why it's not here, but if you look, let me see if there's, a, there's another... Um, Example of this. Let's go here and look at the text. There it is. Ta crema, the judgment. The time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And so in the first century, this is what they wrote. But see, now here is Peter writing that he was ready to judge the living and the dead. That is not what Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching. They were teaching that it had already passed, which means that they were teaching basically the same thing that the people in uh, Thessalonica were teaching. Since we're on that, let's just go there. I'm not 
following any pattern at this particular point. I'm just responding to some of this uh, stuff. I'll get on some things here in a minute. But let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Now, there are some people I've heard that refuse or choose not to um, acknowledge 2 Thessalonians to be a coming again text, a passage related to the coming of the Lord. But the Bible says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the parousia, and our gathering together to him. So here they were gathering to him. This is the gathering in the last days. It's there, Alvin. <laughs> it's definitely there. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So here they are in Thessalonica teaching and believing that the day of the Lord had come. Guess what? It must not have been connected to 12 tribes being back in the land of Israel, because that had not occurred. It must not have been connected to bodies coming out of the ground, because that had not occurred. And it certainly wasn't the sun, moon, and stars of the physical universe falling apart, which tells you that was not their understanding. But notice something here. Something is missing according to what Paul taught and what the Lord taught relative to the coming of the Lord. At the time this was written, it was around A.D. 50 or 51, which means the temple was still standing. The destruction of the city had not occurred. Daniel 70 weeks had not been fulfilled. And here they are, believing that the day had come. Now, when Paul corrects them, he does not tell them, well, look in the ground. Have you seen any bodies coming up out of the ground? I don't even remember all of the stuff that Michael Holloway says about why he thinks the coming of the Lord is future. But just go listen to him and look at all of those reasons that he gives and see if they fit what Paul told those in Thessalonica. Paul gave them two signs to watch for. He didn't tell them to go look over in the graveyard and see how many bodies were missing. You know, if he could find a leg or a finger or something. He said, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. This was a visible sign that they can see. Look, you don't need a sign to point to something that you can see. So if they were looking for the Lord's coming, that was going to be a physical, visible coming of the Lord. They didn't need a sign for that. They could just see it when it happened. But he tells them and he gives them a sign that this falling away is going to occur. And he says, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So that's the next sign. So two signs. Now let's see where this second sign would be found. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, was there a temple existing at the time Thessalonians was written? Of course it was. You see, Paul's, Paul connected his eschatology to the destruction of the temple. Now, if the man of sin is sitting in the temple, and I'm not going to even try to identify who he is, but if his activity is in the temple of God, he says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 
And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the bright, uh, breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders. So he's saying that the coming of the Lord is connected to this judgment on the man of sin who was already at work in the first century in connection with the temple and the only temple that they um, were familiar with was that temple in Jerusalem which is where the Lord said the abomination of desolation would occur.